Hello and welcome to the University of Leeds. My name is Michaela Hardy and I'm going to be just spending a few moments talking a little bit about some of the research work that we do in the Hardy Group, but also linking that in to some of the first year chemistry that I teach here at Leeds. So the topic's metallo cages, and a cage, a chemical cage like any other type of cage, is something where the outside defines an interior space. And like any other type of cage, if you have an interior space, you can put something on the inside. If it's a chemical cage, that means you can put other chemical species on the, in on the inside. And if we can imagine a bird in a cage doesn't behave in the same way that a bird out in the free environment does, then likewise a chemical inside a cage does not necessarily behave in the same way as it would out in free solution. So this can be used to, say, manipulate the chemistry of things. We can use cages as tiny little reaction vessels and have reactants which are bound inside the cage react in a totally different way. Or we can use cages for delivery. We can transport molecules from one place to another for, say, drug delivery, or we can use them as a sensor. So this cage I'm showing here is fluorescent. When we shine a light on it, it glows blue. If we can imagine that this cage then bound a particular substrate, turned that fluorescence off, that gives you a signal to tell you, yes, that particular compound is here and being bound in this environment. Now, a metallic cage has an organic part, and it's linked together by a metal. In this particular case, this is an iridium metal. So, before you can look at applications of cages, you've got to understand how to build them and what factors there are in building them and whether you want to form, say, a little cage like this guy over here or a big cage like the one that's rotating around. And the examples I'm going to show here are using this time around palladium chemistry. So palladium in its 2 plus oxidation state. And this particular complicated looking ligand can either form this palladium 6 ligand 8 huge cube-like assembly or it can form this little guy, three palladiums, two ligands. In both cases, please notice that the palladium has a square planar geometry. So here's our palladiums in light blue. There's one here on this cage, one here on this cage. We can see it's got this square planar type geometry. But how do we control this? How do we know we're going to build a big cage or a little cage according to what we want to do with the cages? So we're going to step backwards slightly here and talk a little bit more about the sorts of compounds these are, which are coordination complexes or transitional metal compounds. And a coordination complex is where you've got a metal ion and it's surrounded by a set of ligands. And a ligand is we define as a, as a molecule or an ion that binds or coordinates to our metal. So here's a picture of a very simple example where we've got iron 2 plus and it's surrounded by six water molecules. And we can see in this crystal structure and the chem draw representation of it that it's the oxygen atoms that are binding to the iron and it does so in a very geometric specific way. So we've got a strict octahedral geometry here around the metal. So if we imagined all of these oxygens joining up, we would form an octahedral structure. And most transition metal complexes have an octahedral geometry. If it's not octahedral, that's usually because of either steric factors or most often because of the number of electrons of that metal. So how do metals and ligands interact? Well, the simplest idea we have about that is the idea of a dative covalent bond where the ligand is going to donate not one, but two electrons to the metal. So that means a good ligand is something that has a lone pair of electrons. So in other words, a good base. So for example, ammonia, nice tetrahedral structure, has a lone pair of electrons. And water, as we've seen, is a good ligand. It has two lone pairs of electrons. So back to our cages. We want to be able to control whether we form big cage or little cage. To do that, we need to be able to, first of all, predict the metal geometry, but also predict which ligands are displaced and which are not. So this is how the chemistry goes. We take this ligand here with a simple palladium complex, palladium 2 plus to nitrate anions, 
two simple nitrogen donor ligands here, and we form the big cage. We use this slightly different palladium species where we've again got ligands with nitrogens that bind to the palladiums, but it's forming this ring type structure. When we use this, then these pyridyls here do not displace this ligand and we get the small cage. So we can see in the small cage, the crystal structure over on the left, that this ring type ligand is forming what we term a chelate ring, is shown in purple. So the ability to be able to do this predictably is going to depend on two things, just to reiterate that. Firstly, that palladium in its 2 plus oxidation state is always an unusual geometry, square planar geometry. And we can invoke something called crystal field theory to explain that. But we also need to be able to predict when one ligand can displace another and when it cannot. And to do that, we need thermodynamics. We can use something called an entropic effect called the chelate effect. So a word on thermodynamics. For a process such as a chemical reaction to be thermodynamically spontaneous, that means the change in Gibbs free energy, delta G, needs to be negative. There are two factors within Gibbs free energy. One of them is the enthalpy, delta H. The other is the entropy, delta S, which also has a temperature dependence. Now enthalpy, delta H, relates to the energy that it's going to cost you, so positive energy that it costs to break your bonds, but also the energy that's then released, so the negative enthalpy, in making new bonds. Entropy, delta S, can be understood as disorder of a system. And if we look at the Gibbs free energy equation, we can see that there's a negative sign here for entropy. So this is telling us that the more entropy there is, the more favorable a process is. But what do we understand by entropy? So we often call it disorder, but what we're really talking about is ways of distributing energy in our systems. So you can think of it as, as the ways that a system has to, to move around, to rotate, to vibrate, to translate. So if we look at a simplified version of our cage chemistry here, then in this top reaction we know that this occurs, but we know that the bottom reaction doesn't occur, that we didn't see this ring type structure being displaced by these four simple pyridols. So in terms of enthalpy, both of these processes are much the same. We're breaking these bonds or these bonds, they're pretty similar, but we're making exactly the same bonds. So this is not an enthalpic effect. What about the entropy? Well, entropy is about disorder in a system and it's about the system. So if we look at our top reaction where we start with five species in solution, we end up with five species in solution. We're not increasing the disorder here or decreasing it. But in our second reaction, we start with five species in solution, but we end up with four. There's only one, two, three ligands that have been displaced here. So we've actually lost entropy. So there's an entropic penalty for doing this, and we don't expect it to happen. Instead, we'll see just the nitrates being displaced by these pyridyls, and this ring-type structure, this chelate ring, stays put. So what we haven't thought about yet is why is it that palladium 2 plus has a square planar geometry instead of the much more common octahedral geometry that many transition metal ions adopt? And the answer to that is going to be in t uh, to do with the number of electrons that we're looking at for palladium, which in its valence shell in the 2 plus state is 8, but also what sort of orbitals these electrons occupy. Transition metals are also known as the D block. That's telling us that it's the D orbitals that are important for transition metals. There are five of those, and here is what their boundary surfaces all look like. So normally, the energies of the five d orbitals would be exactly the same. So I'm just showing that here on an energy diagram where I'm just using a line for each orbital, and we've put eight electrons in, so maximum two electrons per orbital. So it'll all have the same energy. But when we surround a metal by a field of ligands, the energies of these d orbitals split. So some might go to higher energy, some go to lower energy. And what we'll be doing in Chem 12OX 
is developing the theory behind this so that you will be able to predict what these energy splittings look like for all sorts of different metal geometries and then use that to predict both structural factors but also magnetic behaviour, why these compounds are highly coloured and even why they react rapidly or why they react slowly. So that's for next year for hopefully many of you. See you then.